uh, good morning to everyone uh, at the uh, School of Computing and Informatics. Today, we have a very exciting talk on a research topic titled Human Action Recognition in Videos. So recognizing human action is a very important problem, whether it is humans trying to understand other humans' behavior, if it is machines trying to understand human behavior, uh, you know, whether it is uh, cameras in indoor settings or cameras in cars, whatever it is, recognizing human behavior is, 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 is a very, very important problem in, in computer vision. And it is not only important, but it is also very challenging. Okay, uh, so today we have uh, the speaker, Dr. Alexandros Iosifidis, from a professor, professor from Aarhus University at Denmark. Uh, Dr. Iosifidis has been involved uh, in collaboration with the NSF Center for Visual and Digital Informatics. Um, uh, we have been working together for a few years on research collaboration through, uh, through the uh, Tampere University from Finland. And he is a very well-recognized researcher uh, in, in computer vision broadly, and he heads the Machine Learning and Computational Intelligence Group at the uh, Department of uh, ECE and Machine Intelligence Research Area uh, from the University Center for uh, Digitalization, Big Data, and Data Analytics. So he has he has quite an impressive uh, publication track record. He has close to 100 journals, you know, more than 120 conference papers. He has edited several books. He has, he has received several awards. Uh, you know, most notably the Finland's uh, postdoctoral research fellowship award, Young Researcher Prize in 2018 for signal processing and, and machine learning, early career award from Eurosip for his contributions in statistical machine learning, uh, and so on. And the list goes on and on and on. So uh, I, I have benefited uh, from collaboration with uh, Dr. Ayesifidis in, in a big way. Uh, he has great ideas. He's done. Uh, he helps. We are actually collaborating on 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 a research project related to recognizing human behavior uh, in hospitals. So that's the background. Uh, and uh, today we are here to listen his talk about human on human action recognition uh, from from videos. So with that being said, uh, I will hand over the dais to Dr. Iosifidis. Okay, thank you, Razu. Uh, hello, my name is Alexander Iosifidis, and I'm a professor in machine learning and computational intelligence at Aarhus University. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gutumukala and Dr. Najafi for inviting me to give this talk. The topic of the talk will be human action recognition uh, from videos. Here is the agenda. Um, we will start by giving a short overview of the analysis tasks that we encounter when we want to analyze the contents of a video involving human activity. Then we will focus on the different levels of human motion analysis tasks that can be found in the literature, and we will categorize the methodologies in uh, two types. The first type of methodologies uh, is uh, related to human-centric action recognition. Uh, in this type of methods, uh, an action is described as a sequence of human body poses. We will briefly describe the ways such human body poses have been used to represent actions. And then we will focus on the current state-of-the-art paradigm, which uses graph convolutional networks and improvements proposed by our uh, research team, leading to efficient uh, improvements in uh, efficiency and uh, compactness of the neural networks. Uh, the second type of action recognition method approaches the task as a generic video classification task. We will briefly describe how local video information has been used to describe the contents of videos and actions. And then we will describe deep learning models uh, suitable for this task, including the recurrent neural bug of feature 
model which was proposed by us and the continual three conversion neural network, which was also proposed uh, by us. Then uh, conclusions will be uh, will follow. Now, when we analyze a video in terms of uh, the actions that appear in it, we can ask three questions. The first question is, what are people in the video doing? In this task, we are interested only in the types of actions observed in the video without considering when and where in the video frames these actions are depicted. We call this task dreamed action recognition. The second question that we can ask is, when does a human action appear in the video? Here, we are interested both in the type of actions appearing in the video and the index of the video frames in which each of these actions is depicted. We call this task temporal action segmentation. And the third question that we can ask is, when does a human action appear in the video and where is it located? Here, we're interested in the type of actions appearing in the video, the index of all video frames in which uh, these actions are depicted uh, in, the video, uh, in the video, and the location in each video frame where the action is appearing. We, we call this task spatiotemporal action localization. Here, we should note that uh, someone can find in the literature three types three terms uh, referring to uh, similar tasks. Human movement has been used to refer to simple human body actions and gestures, like moving hand, uh, bend, uh, walk, run, and so on. Action is also used to refer to simple actions like walk, run, uh, wave hand, and so on. And it is more often appearing in the literature. Finally, the term activity is commonly used to refer to more complex actions like playing football, playing the guitar, uh, doing gymnastics, and so on. Here we can see. Okay, now we can see uh, some examples of uh, uh, some example videos from three video databases, which have been commonly used for evaluating the performance of methods focusing on human centric action recognition. The KTH and Wiseman datasets uh, were used mostly in, uh, in the 2000s, and they are formed by a small number of videos. The NTU dataset is a larger one, and it has simple uh, actions uh, captured by multiple cameras, and it is currently very often used for evaluation of action recognition methods. As we can observe from these videos, we can see that uh, the actions performed are quite simple. We can also see that the background is quite simple. So especially in the Wiseman and the KTH data set, we can see that the, the background can be easily modeled. Uh, and this is very important for uh, extracting the human body silhouettes as we will see later. And this was the uh, main uh, idea of early methods for human uh, centric action recognition. Also someone can use multiple cameras to create a multi-camera uh, setup. Uh, and the enriched visual information can be used to hopefully improve the performance and robustness of action recognition methods. The volume which is uh, seen by all the cameras, we can see here on the left side, uh, the camera setup with eight cameras. So the volume which is uh, shown in a blue color is called the camera setup capture volume. And it is the, the place in the room where, uh, which can be seen by all the cameras at the same time. Also here on the right side, you can see an early, a younger version of me recording video for a human action recognition data set. Uh, one way that, uh, the human body poses can be used to describe an action is to extract is to extract the human body silhouettes from the video. Then these poses are centered to the human body center of mass and they're scaled to a, pre a predefined size. For example, in this case, uh, this example will use a size of 32 by 32 pixels. These two preprocessing steps are performed in order to provide translation and scaling invariance to the method as the position uh, in the video frames where the action is depicted and the distance of the person to the camera should not affect the result of the action recognition method. An action is formed by successive human body poses which are 
combined in various ways to form a vector, which is introduced to a classifier for recognizing which is the action depicted in the video. This approach can achieve high performance, but it is based on quite strict assumptions. And these assumptions are that high quality human body silhouettes can be extracted from the video. The entire human body is visible, or at least the parts of the human body which are responsible for recognizing the action should be very well visible. And also the scene in which the action is depicted is, has a simple background. This is in order to make sure that the human body poses and the, the silhouettes that we extract from the video are of high quality. One way to represent the action, an action based on the detected human body silhouettes is to create a motion history image. This is a grayscale image created by superimposing the body silhouettes and weighting them based on the timing of observing each human body pose in the video sequence. Silhouettes appearing last are shown wider and the grayscale level is becoming lower as we move back in time. For example, here, this uh, case here on the, <coughs> on the middle corresponds to a person uh, uh, raising uh, his hands. So we can see that the uh, the pixels are uh, becoming uh, light, lighter, so the, the whiter uh, at the high uh, at the locations which are next to the uh, to the person's uh, head. So we can see that the grayscale values of the motion history image can uh, encode information related to the succession of the human body poses. This motion history image is then uh, segmented to the human body locations and introduced to the classifier which provides the label of the depicted action. Another way to combine the human body silhouettes is to create the so-called space-time shapes. This means that we can use each human body silhouette as a channel in a 3D tensor in which the third dimension corresponds to time. Then these space-time shapes are introduced to a classifier for recognizing the action. Another way to represent an action using human body silhouettes is to create the bag of features representation of it. This approach has been used in many problems where we want to create vector-based representation out of a set of vectors. The main idea here is that uh, we would like to determine a set of representative human body poses, uh, which uh, using the human body silhouettes uh, coming from the videos forming the training set. This can be done by clustering all the human body silhouettes in the training videos. And this can be done, for example, by applying K-means clustering method. Then the cluster centers are forming the columns of the codebook uh, formed by the human body prototypes. The codebook, uh, the codebook vectors uh, have been also uh, named as DNIPS. This uh, is the uh, corresponding uh, term to the phonemes used in the natural language process. <clears throat> so this codebook is used to obtain the histogram of the human body silhouettes describing both the training action videos and the test action videos. And using the bag of features uh, representations of the training videos, we can train a classifier. And this classifier can also be used to classify the bag of features representations of the test videos. Another way to represent an action using human body silhouettes is to create the so-called action volumes. And we can see here that uh, an action can uh, have a duration of more than uh, more uh, human body silhouettes than the size of the action uh, volume. And in order to, uh, to create an action volume which has a specified size, we can perform interpolation in the time domain uh, and the resulting volume can be used in order to represent the uh, action. When an action is captured by a multi-camera setup, uh, the human body silhouettes obtained from different viewing angles can be used to create a 3D convex hull of the human body, which is a three-dimensional uh, human body silhouette. Such three-dimensional uh, human body silhouettes can be used to create uh, motion history volumes, which is the extension of the motion history image to three dimensions. For example, here we can see this corresponds to the action of uh, fall down. So the red uh, 
pixels correspond to the most recent uh, human body pose. And we can see that uh, the person was standing and then uh, uh, sat down. Or this is the, the motion uh, uh, history volume of a person walking. So the person was here and then uh, he or she was moving on the right, on the left uh, direction. In order to make the classification of such uh, motion history volumes, some preprocessing steps uh, are applied, like scaling and rotating the resulting volumes to pre specified size and uh, axis. One uh, assumption that is very uh, strict here is that the human body poses should be visible from all viewing angles. If this is not the case, then the resulting uh, 3D human body silhouette will be of low quality and this will uh, uh, lead to low um, performance in actual classification. <clears throat> in order to create the three-dimensional human body silhouette, the human body uh, should be visible from all the cameras. However, uh, when the person is performing uh, the action outside the camera setup, a uh, capture volume, his or her body will not be seen from all the cameras. In order to use the enriched information from a varying number of cameras which uh, observe the action, one can perform action recognition on each camera independently and then combining the results, uh, the classification results from all the cameras which observe the action in order to provide the final classification uh, result. For example, in this case, this person, person A, uh, performs the action outside the capture volume of the camera setup. And this means that this camera cannot observe uh, what is the action performed. Why? Because the uh, field of view of the camera is in this uh, volume, okay? So the person is outside the field of view of the camera. So this camera cannot provide any uh, classification result. However, this camera can observe the person and can also uh, process the human body silhouettes and provide the classification result, which is the result, the action walk. Okay? So all the cameras here, which have a, a, a green color, provide a classification result, while the, those which have a red color cannot provide this case result. Now, uh, one way that can be used to do this, to combine the classification results of different uh, cameras in order to provide, uh, hopefully, a better classification result, is to use a majority voting rule. This means that the final action is decided to be the action which is more frequently detected in all the cameras which provide an action classification result. Another approach is to perform a probabilistic fusion based on uh, the bias rule. For example, uh, we can see here at the, at the bottom, uh, we can see that one can combine information regarding the detected action. Uh, here you can see the A hat and the uh, detected viewing angle for each of the cameras uh, contributing to the final classification result. And this is uh, very important because uh, as we can see here, in this, these are some results by using single camera classification uh, of human actions in this setup here, this setup here. So we can see that the use of the Ewing angle formation can be crucial for some types of actions because uh, several actions have a specific viewing angle which uh, can lead to perfect classification, while there are some other uh, viewing angles which can lead to lower uh, performance. For example, as expected, for uh, the action walk, the side views provide higher performance. Uh, for the action, uh, uh, wave hand, the frontal views provide the best performance. For the action bend, the side views provide the best performance. So this, uh, these results uh, can be explained intuitively, but also we can see that uh, from the data that this is the case. <clears throat> now, the biggest assumption in human body pose-based actual recognition methods described so far is that a high quality human body silhouette can be detected for each video frame. However, the background of the scene, uh, when the background of the scene is simple uh, and the camera is not moving, this can be achieved. However, in general cases of clutter background and camera movement, the resulting human body silhouettes are poor. 
Recent advanced methods in human body skeleton detection can address this limitation. These methods uh, can accurately detect a predefined uh, set of human body locations like the joints on the arms, the shoulders, the knees, and position of eyes and ears and so on. Here we can see a demo of our recently proposed human body skeleton-based axial cognition uh, methods uh, by our postdoc. Uh, at the top left of the video frames, we can see the most probable axions uh, for the specific uh, video frames, along with the softmax uh, scores of the classifier, which provides the, the classification result. So we can see that the skeleton detection method provides a, a good result. It does a good job in providing an accurate uh, skeleton, which is then used to describe the action. Now, one of the most widely used software libraries for human body detection, skeleton detection is OpenPose, and we used this uh, uh, library for extracting the human body poses in this case. Now, uh, using the human body skeletons, representing the human body poses for a number of video frames, we obtain a spatiotemporal graph structure. The nodes of this spatiotemporal graph are the two-dimensional or three-dimensional coordinates of the skeleton joints. When we have the uh, 3D formation, so color plus depth, we can extract the uh, 3D location of each joint of the skeleton. When we perform the skeleton uh, detection method on uh, videos, on video frames, we cannot extract the three-dimensional representation, but we extract the X and Y coordinates of each joint on uh, the video frame. The edges of the spatiotemporal graph uh, are of, of two types. Spatial edges connect human body joints of the same skeleton based on the natural connectivity of the human body parts, while temporal edges connect the same node across consecutive human body skeletons. For example, in this case, this uh, uh, node is connected with this node because this corresponds to the hand, this corresponds to the uh, uh, elbow. Uh, so there is a, a natural connection between these two uh, joints on the human body. So this is a part of the spatial graph, while the uh, node corresponding to the hand on one video frame and the hand on the second video frame, uh, these are connected uh, using a temporal edge. So this, the temporal edges show how each node is moving uh, through time. Something that is worth noting here is that similar types of spatiotemporal graphs can be used to approach other computer vision problems, like the problem of facial expression recognition using spatiotemporal graph formed by Larmac points on the human face. And you can see how we did, uh, how we used similar approaches in this paper, which was published uh, last year. Now, the current state of the art uh, paradigm in performing human body skeleton-based actual recognition is using a type of neural networks which can exploit the spatial and temporal relationships of the graph nodes in the human body skeletons. And this type of neural network is called the spatiotemporal graph convolutional network. This deep neural network performs two types of convolutions. The first one, uh, the representations of the human body joints are fused using the graph adjacency matrix. So here the age matrix corresponds to the representations of each. Uh, joint in the or node in the uh, skeleton. The adjacency matrix is the matrix AP, is a matrix which indicates the connection of the human body joints. So it corresponds to the edges between the joints uh, on the skeleton, on each skeleton independently. There are also cases where the connection that is not appearing, a connection that is not appearing naturally in the uh, connectivity of the human body joints can be important in recognizing an action. For example, let's consider the action of uh, calling, uh, talking to the phone. So we would expect that this action, uh, when we observe a person performing this action, then that person would have his or her phone next to his or her ear. So this means that there is a connection between uh, this joint 
of the human body with a joint which corresponds to the ear. But this connection is not appearing in the natural connection between the human body joints on the skeleton. So one would expect that if we are able to learn that this axion is connected with such a connection between these two joints, this would help us recognize better the action uh, talking to the phone, okay? So uh, such uh, artificially created uh, connections between the human body joints in the skeleton are uh, learned in a data-driven way by using the spatial attention mask uh, M. <clears throat> okay, so after aggregating the information of the human body joints through the graph structure, then feature transformation is performed by the weight matrix of the layer W. Okay. The transformed features for each human body skeleton are finally aggregated by applying a temporal convolution, which is shown on the right side of this uh, slide. This convolution is implemented by applying a standard 2D convolution on the time domain of the resulting tensor. Okay, so even though the spatiotemporal graph convolutional networks and extensions of them achieve good performance on axial recognition, they have, these all methods have three drawbacks. We tried to propose ways to address these drawbacks by proposing new methods improving their performance or efficiency. The first drawback is that uh, all these models process a long sequence of skeletons with redundant uh, human body poses. This leads to high computations without necessarily improving performance. Considering the nature of the problem to be solved, uh, one would expect that it is sufficient to process a subset of the human body skeletons and to get high classification performance. This would lead to lowering the number of float point operators needed to provide the classification result, which will in turn lead to faster execution. For example, in this case, we see a person uh, moving his hands. So we can see that the human body skeletons of successive video frames are quite similar. So one would expect that we don't need to have all these human body skeletons to recognize this action, but yeah, some key skeletons might be needed in order to provide good classification result without the need to process all the skeletons. So we can reduce the computational complexity. However, for different actions and different viewing angles, the position of these skeletons in the human body a skeleton sequence might differ. So it's not sufficient to say that we will process every fifth skeleton. We need the method to decide itself which of the skeletons are more important to classifying the specific action. So in order to address this issue, we propose the temporal attention augmented graph conversion network, which performs a data-driven selection of the human body skeletons. This is done through the temporal attention module, which is shown here at the top right of the neural network uh, topology. Uh, this module provides a score, uh, a score for each skeleton, and then these scores are ranked, and the top ones are selected to be processed further in the network topology. The parameters of this temporal attention module are optimized jointly with the parameters of the neural network. And because we place this temporal attention module early on in the neural network structure, this means that all the, success, the layers of the neural network after that point, they don't need to process all the human body skeletons, but they process the subset of the most representative human body skeletons. Now, by doing this, we can achieve a reduction on the number of floating point operators we need to perform, while we achieve a very comparable performance compared to using all the human body skeletons. Here, we can see results on the NTU RGBT and the kinetic skeleton datasets. As we can see, for a relatively high range of number of skeletons, for example, here or here, the performance remains uh, stable, the same, more or less, while the computations uh, needed for performing the classification reduce in a more or less linear form. Okay, So we can achieve performance which is very comparable to the performance that we would achieve by using all the skeletons, while we can reduce the performance dramatically compared to the competing methods. 
The second drawback of the spatiotemporal GCN uh, methods uh, is that all these methods are using a relatively high number of layers. Moreover, moreover, the number of layers to be used for a different action classification problem should be determined through uh, experimentation, which can be time consuming. To address this issue, we proposed a neural architecture search method, which can determine a problem specific network topology based on a data driven process. We also observed that the resulting neural network topologies are compact, which means that they uh, require a small number of computations in the inference phase. The progressive spatiotemporal graph convolutional network follows a progressive neural network topology building approach. We start with a spatiotemporal GCN, which is formed by one hidden layer formed by a block of spatiotemporal graph convolutional neurons. After training this uh, network, we augment its structure by adding one more block of neurons, which is then optimized. When the performance uh, obtained by adding a new block in the current hidden layer of the network saturates, then we stop adding new blocks. And then we check if the performance improves by adding one new layer in the network. If this, uh, if this is the case, if the performance is improved, then we add a new layer and then we apply the same process as before by adding one block at a time and check the performance uh, obtained by adding a new block. If the performance obtained by adding one additional layer is not improved, then we stop the process and then the resulting neural network topology is the one determined by the method. This topology is then fine-tuned in an end-to-end -end manner for improving the classification performance. Comparing the performance of the data-driven neural network topologies obtained by our PSTGCL method with those of related works, we can see that they lead to competitive performance while they have much smaller number of computation. And here we can see the number of computations. So here we can see the plot of number of floating uh, point operators with respect to the accuracy for two data sets. And the proposed methods are these methods here and here. So we can see that the proposed methods which optimize, which determine the structure of the STGCN by using the data-driven uh, training process achieve high accuracy while the number of floating point operators is quite small. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. The third drawback of the spatiotemporal graph coercion network and its uh, variants is that they use a fixed spatial structure through, throughout the layers of the network. This structure is uh, refined by using the spatial att attention mask but it cannot change in terms of number of nodes. In order to address this issue, we had to make connections between graph conversion networks and bilinear networks. By observing that the spatial graph convolution, which can be seen here, uh, equipped with spatial attention, uh, we can see that this in, in practice corresponds to a bilinear projection. So we have the transformation matrix on the right hand side, this, this uh, corresponds to the feature transformation of the layer. And on the left hand side, we have the uh, spatial uh, convolution. So we have on the left side the adjustment matrix plus the attention mask. And this uh, adjustment matrix is fixed, but the attention mask is optimized end to end uh, during the training process. So we can see that on the left hand side, we have a learnable matrix, and on the right hand side, we have a learnable matrix. So this in practice corresponds to a bilinear projection. Uh, and the adjustment matrix acts only as an initialization of the left hand side uh, map. So approaching the spatial graph convolution as a bilinear mapping it has the advantage that one can now decide what is the level of granularity uh, he or she wants to use for representing the human body pose. This means that one can decide to aggregate the information in a few graph nodes by using a fat matrix uh, UP. 
or to expand the number of graph nodes by using a tall matrix UP. In the extreme case, one can decide to aggregate the entire information of uh, the graph, uh, all the graph nodes to one node, and this can be achieved by using a vector UP instead of a matrix UP. So we compare the performance of using, of performing this extreme uh, information aggregation uh, going from multiple nodes representing the graph, the, the skeleton, to one node on different layers of the network topology. And we can see that we can achieve very good performance by aggregating the information early on on the network topology, for example, by using four, five, six, seven layers. So this means that we can achieve high performance, but as we can see here, we can also reduce the number of computations a lot. So one could say that we can reduce the number of computations by a factor of uh, two, 2.5, and achieving the same performance compared to using uh, graph convolutional layers uh, throughout the network topology. Okay, so until now we described ways to recognize actions in videos by assuming that the human body poses can be detected. Let's run this. <clears throat> and uh, the human body poses can be used for describing the actions. However, in the general case of complex actions performed in cluttered backgrounds, captured by moving cameras at different distances from the persons performing the actions, this is not the case. For example, here it would be very difficult to extract the human body pose or here. Here we can see uh, example videos from four public databases of human activity uh, recognition. As we can see, they depict activities which are much more complex compared to the actions appearing in the databases focusing in human centric action recognition that we described before. When dealing with complex activities, the most widely adopted way to recognize them in videos is to perform a generic video classification and having as classes uh, to be recognized the activity classes uh, of interest. Early approaches uh, were using local spatiotemporal video information. Here we can see uh, two example videos and the detected uh, space time interest points. Uh, these space-time interest points are detected by uh, a detector which extends the interest point detector, the highest interest point detector in three dimensions. Now we try to uh, detect points which undergo uh, abrupt changes both in X, Y plus T. Detecting such uh, spatiotemporal uh, space-time interest points helps us in reducing the size of the data to be processed as the video classification method will process information in the local neighborhood of these points and not the entire video. After detecting the space-time interest points, we need to detect the information in their, to describe the information in their neighborhood. Several descriptors can be used like the histogram of oriented gradient, the local binary pattern, or simply by using the cube centered at the space-time interest point. This uh, descriptor is called cuboid. Another approach is to detect interest points only at a given video frame and then track the positions of these interest points for a number of consecutive video frames, for example, 14. This way, the space-time cube will uh, be created for each interest point, which can be used to represent, uh, which can be represented by uh, multiple descriptors. And here we can see an example. As can be seen, this approach leads to much higher number of interest points compared to the space-time interest points uh, that we saw before. This further leads to a higher computational cost comparing to using space-time interest points. However, the methods which use these uh, interest points plus their trajectories usually achieve much higher uh, performance. Moreover, when uh, the actions are captured by a stereo camera, which means that uh, we can use the enriched information of color uh, plus the disparity between uh, the locations of uh, uh, pixels in the two uh, cameras, 
we can use this analytic information in order to detect uh, interest points which undergo into abrupt changes both in space x y plus in disparity and as you can see here this can uh, lead to detecting interest points which are uh, not in the background so we expect that interest points which are in the foreground can contribute in recognizing uh, actions after obtaining the vectors describing the properties in the local neighborhoods of interest points, one can create a vector to represent the entire video by using the bug of features uh, scheme. The codebook in this case is created by clustering the vectors describing local information of interest points uh, in the training videos. And then we can use a classifier in order to classify these uh, vectors. It has been shown that uh, using a kernel-based classifier, where the kernel uh, is the radial basis function using the his square distance, uh, is a good classifier which can lead to high performance. Now, moving on to recent, to more recent methods for video classification, we can distinguish three types of methods based on different types of deep learning neural networks. Uh, on the one hand, on the left side, uh, we have methods which process its video frame in order to extract a high performing representation. And the representations of the uh, video frames in the video uh, are aggregated by using a recurrent neural network. For example, the long short term memory network. Another approach is to consider the video as a three dimensional version of an image. So we have X, Y, and time. And then we can use a 3D conversion neural network which performs a representation learning both in space and time to provide the final classification result. A similar approach is also used by the very recently proposed uh, video transformers. Here, we will focus on the first two types of methods uh, using uh, either 2D CNNs plus a Ricard neural network and using the 3D CNNs. Our recent work on activity recognition based on transformers can be found in the, paper, in the preprint shown in this slide. As I said before, in order to classify a video, we perform feature extraction, which is usually done by using a number of course and network, provisional layers, operating on each video frame independently. Then the extracted video frame representations are introduced to a recurrent neural network. We have recently proposed the recurrent neural, neural bug of features network, which can be used to lower the number of parameters uh, of the recurrent uh, network and achieve high performance compared to standard recurrent neural networks. And here we can see some comparison with the gated recurrent uh, unit so we can, on the UCF 101 dataset. So we can see that the recurrent neural bug of feature achieves uh, better performance uh, consistently for different uh, sets of uh, hyperparameter values. Now, the last method that I will describe is the 3D conversion neural network. So the standard uh, version of the 3D CNNs uh, receives as uh, input a video clip formed by n video frames, and it produces a classification result. When these networks are used for online action recognition, in order to provide a classification result for the next video frame, we need to keep a buffer of n of the n most recent video frames. And every time we want to perform a classification, we need to process n video frames. So we use a sliding window of n video frames. This leads to uh, redundancy in computations performed uh, as the computations uh, performed on the n minus one video frames, which were processed just in the previous uh, window, uh, have been already conducted and we just uh, don't use them. To address this issue, we redefined the operation of 3D uh, convolution. And by using this new definition, we proposed the continual 3D CNNs. A continual 3D CNN receives a input and continual video stream and computes an output for each video frame. This means that each video frame is processed once, which speeds up the processing uh, uh, considerably. So the main idea is that we perform the, uh, the 3D convolution 
of the previous frames and we store the intermediate results. We have shown that storing the partial feature maps for previously processed video frames leads to lower memory requirements compared to standard 3D CNNs. This is because as we move in the layers of the network, the uh, receptive field, so the, the size of the tensors, which is the output of its layer, reduces. So instead of having to process a big tensor of the video, we can process each slice of the video, video frame. And by storing the intermediate outputs, which are of a reducing, reduced size for uh, as we move at the end of the network, then the intermediate size, uh, intermediate outputs of the layers correspond to a smaller uh, memory size. Now, the gains achieved by using our continual 3D CNN reach a reduction in the number of computations of one order of magnitude, leading to a speed up of up to 6.7 times when we use a GPU, or up to 9.2 times when we use a CPU, compared to the standard 3D CNN. The computational complexity corresponding to using a larger video clip is constant with respect to the uh, convolutional and normalization layers and linear with respect to the global pool size. This means that we can use a longer effective video clip size very cheaply. So this means that we can remember in the 3D CNN what happened earlier compared to just using the standard uh, sliding window approach. Okay, we conducted an extensive uh, set of uh, experiments and evaluations uh, comparing our uh, continual 3D CNN with the 3D CNN, the corresponding 3D CNN. So we can see uh, uh, that the continual 3D CNN leads to improvements in the floating point operators uh, of at least one order of magnitude. When using the CPU, the speed up gains range from a factor of 5.9 to 9.2 while when you use a GPU the, of different processing capabilities, the speed up gains a range from 4.15 to 7.16. And also we can see that we can achieve real-time operation on high-end GPUs, but also on embedded GPUs. Here you can see Lucas, uh, he's a PhD student in, uh, in our group, and we have the same setup. So action, actions, and then here we can see the classification results provided for the specific video frame. <clears throat> okay, so most of the recent methodologies described in this presentation have been integrated in a new software a toolkit, which is a result of a European Union project called Open Deep Learning for Robotics. The main objective of this toolkit is to provide an easy way for people working in computer and robot perception problems to deploy efficient deep learning models for a number of visual perception tasks. A description of the toolkit and the way that it can be used can be found in the preprint shown in this slide. Okay, so to conclude, we introduced the human axial cognition uh, problem uh, along with different variations of it in the literature. We described human aesthetic action cognition methods, exploring two types of human body poses, the human body silhouettes and the human body skeletons. We introduced the spatiotemporal GCNs uh, and extensions that we proposed recently for improving their speed and performance. We described the video classification based action cognition methods based on local information and interest points. And we also introduced the 3D CNNs uh, and our recently proposed continual 3D CNNs for improving their efficiency in continual, in online uh, human access. Now, more information can be found in our website. And uh, also in my website, you can find a list of software for more than uh, 60, 70 uh, methods that we have proposed in the last 10 years. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I would be happy to respond to any questions. <clears throat>